I am super excited. You have a wonderful uh, opportunity in front of you to learn from someone who's been super helpful to the work of the UIA and who is going to give us some real time learning about how the heck all of this is happening and why is there value in people working together. So um, today uh, we have a pun for our title uh, and a superstar for our talent. And that is Frank Dooley from Purdue. And so we are calling this uh, interview a frank conversation about Purdue. It's duly important. Frank, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. I wonder, starting with the pun, that's a little bit scary, Bridge. I'd be glad to be here. I, you know, I know how much you love them. So I really want to just like honor you. Uh, I, I heard that puns were your love language. Uh, yeah, I have a daughter who has inherited it. It makes it fun for me. So absolutely. Wow. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know in our audience, um, Frank is one of the liaisons with the UIA. And so you've met a couple other of our liaisons. You met Saquon, you met Tim Rennick. Earlier this week, you met Harrison Keller from UT Austin. But this is the person who has been, um, essentially who's been my primary contact at Purdue to kind of keep the work going, to make sure that they're engaging with the UIA, they're getting what they need, um, you know, most people focus on how the university presidents and chancellors are the board, but the work gets delegated to people like Frank and that on the day-to-day -day level, he really needs to make sure that it works for Purdue. So um, he's a longtime liaison for the UI and he is the uh, senior vice provost for teaching and learning, correct? Correct. And if you recall, I'm also... We, we, we've seen rotation in these liaison jobs across the 11 universities. I was the first one who replaced somebody else, if you recall that. It's a great job that I have, and I love every day, and, and working with you and UI is part of it that makes it so special for me. So. Oh, well, yeah, because it's our five-year anniversary, we're, we're, we're particularly emotional about it. So good, 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 good. <laughs> Um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to dive in with you is, you know, there's a lot of things we can talk about with Purdue. There's, you know, income share agreements and pretty groundbreaking work that's going on there. There's uh, the freezing of tuition. There's what it's like to work with a leader like Mitch Daniels, who's just uh, idea a minute and actually executes. Um, but I thought that we would talk today about something that comes up quite often, which is predictive analytics. And um, Purdue didn't used to be kind of the uh, seen as the best in class when it came to this predictive analytics scale project uh, in the Alliance. But now you're who I talk about. So I'd love to talk about that story about how Purdue wasn't really going to do predictive analytics um, in the first year the UIA decided to scale it. And then what has been that experience for you? And um, could you share with our audience what you've learned by being in the UIA? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great segue, Bridge, and thanks for the question. I Actually, I wouldn't even say best in class. We were last in class is probably when this all started. You know, the, 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 the whole notion of, of predictive analytics and where it takes us and what it can do, it's a word predictive analytics is one that's subject to a lot of interpretation. But, but I think speaking for the UIA, what most of the schools uh, – we were looking at products, now, you know, I'll use a product name like EAB slash SSC or Civitas or something like that and the, and the use of the tool. And I wasn't even in the role when Purdue decided, no, we're not going to do this. Then I came in the room and I, and I think when I walked in the room, everyone else is marching down this path and, and I'm trying to figure out where Purdue is and, and what are you doing. One of the benefits, though, and, 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 of, of being late is I got to, we got to observe what was going on at the other schools. And, and Purdue, in, the, in this case, we learned a lot by talking to the folks at Oregon State, Ohio State, Michigan State. And because of that, I, I think we have actually been able to, to, to go a lot farther than they have. And I can tell you why, if you'd like to know. Yeah, I wanna know. Well, I, I think anytime we, we, you install, you know, the EABs of the world and the Civitas's, we, we did an RFP process, brought them to campus, saw the demonstrations, and, and then they do these amazing shows, right? And they're, they're very polished. The people who work with students are hungry for data. They're hungry for information that gives you this insight. If I look at this, don't take this course, or if you're gonna do this, all this kind of stuff that you see in the show, we're, we're just eager to have it because a lot of the advising work historically has been, you know, paper-based model, right? Yeah. So, so and, 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 and as somebody who's working day in, day out with students, it's just a challenge sometimes to keep up with everything. We, we got it. We saw the same show that everyone else did. 
<laughs> Here's what we did that was different. And and I, in my teaching, I'm an ag econ professor, agricultural economics professor as well, and I, I teach supply chain. And, and supply chain, when you're doing a technological installation, and that's what buying something like EAB SSC, I talk about three things, people, process, technology. All right, so let's take technology and slide that. The, we bought the technology. We chose after we looked at all these EAB SSC. So now you're, you're down to two things, people and process. Uh, I, I think universities, we did something really, really smart with the people. And, and, and when I think of, of the concept of people, what I'm really talking about, how are the people who are going to use this tool work with it? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, so, so this is not like, you know, I'm an old guy. And when I, computers to me, when, when it was install new software, it's getting like, you know, the five inch floppy drives and install and push. And then you wait and you saw this thing spinning. Like, you know, it, these things are so sophisticated and take a lot to get in play and a lot of work to get done. Um, so, so what we did and, and where we, I think, had a strength is we, we put together a four person team. Two of these people were advisors and two of them were, I'll call them technologists. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we, we really, the advisors who were in the room as we were unfolding this, they're telling us, this is how we work. This is what we need to do. And we listened to them. Right. And, and, and we, we really, they guided that. And a lot of the stuff that they were familiar with, they understood, but you want to make it work on your campus if you mm -hmm. would. And then what we did along with it, so it's in part change management, in part what I'm going to call it is professional development slash training. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have sessions in a big, you know, lecture hall and pull 100 people in. And then you had one person at the front of the room moving the mouse around. Now you click here, now you click here. None of that training in my mind is very effective. So the training actually, to a certain extent, was really personalized to the work that they had. So, so the, the person working in the room with you, and, and then we would go through some of the, the, I'll say, typically the younger advisors, more computer savvy. You know, this, oh, I get this, and it was easy for them to work. We have some advisors who are very experienced, might have been more difficult for them. We might go back two, three times and do one-on-ones and help them. So, so the, the onboarding and the training is something that we did really, really well. The second thing the advisors, as they're working with it, they got really concerned uh, about, you know, you, you can put notes in the system. And part of the notion is we're sharing information about a student. Mm -hmm. Well, do I want to tell you about everything about this student? Should I be telling you that this student has, uh, you know, an accommodation with our disability resource center? Should I be, you know, and, and some of these privacy concerns were very real. And, and so what did we do? Once again, we got a whole group of advisors. We sat down and they built out a notes protocol and they started talking about how do we want. And then you brought in the experts from the outside and all of a sudden through the communication, the conversations we had, they agreed in how they're going to take notes. Now, when you have some confidence with the tool, it gets a lot easier for everybody to do it. And, and what would we continue to do? Well, you know, this is one of the jobs on campus. We're hiring, there, there's constantly people coming and moving on, but we have a really good onboarding process. So somebody new comes to it. We're, we're trying to remind the users who are there and stuff. So, so I think we, we've been very good about the people and the users with it. Yeah. And, and, and I think if you make it a tool that becomes useful for them in their job, it gets a lot easier for them to, to buy into the notion. Yeah, I would also say you are unusual in that you included advisors, right? Like, um, because a lot of campuses who are talking about, um, you know, product selection, what I find is they bring in their their, their data person, yep. they bring in a technology CIO level person, nobody talks to an advisor, no one even thinks about them, but that's actually the user that you need to be worried about. Um, and so the fact that you were from the beginning intentional about including and making sure it was working for them, like this is the stuff that, you, that is the benefit of watching others go first. Absolutely, absolutely. And that, that, that was a lesson learned, if you would, an, an advantage. Um, I mean, the other thing is when I was faculty member back in agricultural economics, I actually was an academic advisor for students as well. Ah, that so, so I kind of got it. Now, now, remember, we started this, the preface was predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. 
There is predictive analytics built into the EAB product. I'll say for West Lafayette, it doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that one of the problems with it, it, it is a black box predictive analytics. And I, my hunch, and we've talked to EAB a lot about, so they know that we're struggling with that part of it. Um, but my hunch is the population of students that, that it was where they did for the underlying analysis and algorithms is very different. You know, we're, we're one of the most STEM centric universities in the country, all right? I got 62% of my students in engineering, computer science and whatnot. And it's just a different model probably that need to be developed. So we actually haven't used much of the predictive analytics that they have. Now there's components that they've done. A second thing that I've done, and we're just doing this right now, just, and this is a lesson I learned from Tim, Ren Tim Rennick, you know, Tim has a person, he asks questions, right? I'm interested in this. So I now have a person, I have a question, and she's gonna be able to dive into the data that, that the EAB product supports and start to ask questions. So where are students in this major struggling? What course is giving them problems, right? How do we see students migrating if they're not, you know, all these kind of things. And I'm hoping to do a lot like Tim. And, and once again, it's benefited the UIA. Um, you know, you're able to call somebody and trust, you know, I, I trust all the people that we work with and, and, and relationships really matter in our work. I 100% agree, and but I also I I appreciate that um, it's about the candor and the, the level of trust in those relationships. So, because I recall multiple times in like a failure sharing session, um, talking about these issues while you were in the midst of figuring them out and having your colleagues, you know, offer ideas, but also then your problem or your question was then giving other people ideas about where they might need to dig in. And then they found a new problem. That's right. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah. It, the give and take is, is why, that, that's why we call it conversation, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's really useful. Well, um, it's been great to watch because again, uh, Purdue was not going to be doing predictive analytics. You were going to sit this out uh, for a hot minute there. It was going to be, you were going to kind of invent your own uh, system. And then now, because you kind of you got to watch and, and observe and see, you benefited from how do people make the choice about which provider, which provider, you know, was actually delivering versus what they promised. And also, you know, how to engage with them and how to support your campus in navigating this new provider once they, once it was a real thing. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing that's important, um, I, I do want to give EAB a lot of credit because we have been very I'm going to use the word aggressive in approaching them. We thought it was going to do this. It's not. Help us figure this out. And, and, and I think to a certain extent, a lot of the clients that they had were non-UAA type universe. They were smaller schools that didn't have as large of it. They, they weren't as complex, perhaps. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the model that they had probably works really well in that setting. But but. You know, I got 10 academic colleges and an honors college and exploratory study, and I got 200 plus advisors all over the place. It's a, it, it's a complicated place. Um, I, and the other thing where we are with EAB today, that they do have like a council who they turn to of people from universities. And, and my, uh, my number two person, Jenna Rickus, is going to serve on that. She's going to start serving, I believe, in November for the next couple of years. So we're pretty confident that EAB is valuing the feedback that we're giving them to make it even a better tool for, for universities like ourselves. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. So this is, um, for folks who are at home, this is about kind of, sometimes you don't know, you know, sometimes your institution is not ready to change. Maybe yeah. your institution is just ready to learn just to listen, to consider. Um, there is a whole, uh, there are a lot of universities who are not really change ready, but they are ready to observe and it will get them to the place of being change ready. And I think that, you know, sitting it out when you're not ready is, is the right move. It, well, it was at the time, right? And But as you know, Mitch Daniels is, you know, he, he's not so much a guy that's gonna sit and change. It's, it's the yeah. change and, and how we go forward. So so navigating this has been, been been a useful exercise for me. Yeah, good luck sitting out for long. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. But, Mitch is going 500 miles an hour and you're coming with him, so. Yeah, no, I, and, and I mean, um, 
but that's okay. And and I think in the process, you know, change. As soon as you talk about change, the the normal reaction is I'm going to you know, be like the turtle and withdraw into my shell. I don't want to change. Is is like, but I think y- you have to be very open about it and, and talk about here's what we're thinking about doing. Here's how we're thinking about doing it. I think when change tends to fail is when it's and, and let me talk about you know we brought the advisors in at the front end. I think if if I had been in my office in our you know our a main administration bill and said we're going to do this without any regard to how you use the tool, it'd probably be in the scrap heap by now. But the fact that the tool is built out to support them in their work and allow them to be better at their work, uh, the, the the one other thing. We've moved way beyond advisors. We now have, I'm guessing, 50 different offices using the, our, our career center is using it. Our tutoring centers are using it. Our, our residential life is using it. We've got read-only access for offices like our academic integrity and our, our counseling center, et cetera. And when we talk about using it, it, there's a whole community around it right now. And, and it's more like, well, can we use the tool for this as well? So so we've really switched the, the conversation right now. It's become an expectation, but they see the value. And, and that's part of the change management is once the users see how this is going to make their life better and make it more, make them more productive, it, 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 then it becomes easy. And it's also finding those early adopters and having those two advisors in the room um, who were brutally honest with us, but we're smart enough to listen to them. I think that was part of the, the key as well. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree in terms of uh, this change not being forced on them, that the, you actually, you don't just seek buy-in, but you actually right. take it seriously. But the experience of change, because some people brought EAB in or brought in predictive analytics, and it's uh, been introduced as a way to hold advisors accountable and possibly fire them. That's not going to be the kind of change anybody's yeah. going to Well, I wouldn't be happy with that either, right? Yeah. Now, um, on the other hand, it, it does give us a lot of information and we can get a sense of, you know, maybe I have places where uh, I can go in and look at how they're using the system. And when, when you got place, I might have some departments just struggling from the workload it does allow us to look, take a look back and go, okay, maybe we can move an advisor. Maybe I need more generalists. Those kinds of questions that before I never could have got to. So, so yeah. there's value in that as well. No, I 100% agree. And, um, you know, that's a big part of what the UIA work is focused on is the experience of change. The experience of change should not be uh, one of the things we pick up is it's very lonely. Um, you're kind of sent out on the desert by yourself. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of our experiences are about be- giving people a sense of community because they might go home and need to do the work somewhat alone, but they at least need allies that they can call. They need to feel like they are not alone because um, change is hard. And universities draw people in who are more interested in certainty than uncertainty. And that can be a real issue because change is a lot of uncertainty. So you got to smooth that over by building community. You got to make sure that you're focused on um, validating when people do good things. Um, And you also need to create a place where people can be honest when things are not working instead of, you know, I want to hear no feedback. You're going to do as I say, and I'll see you eventually but we will not celebrate your work. <laughs> right. And, and I think the uh, that last point is really good. We, we've celebrated a couple times. We probably haven't celebrated enough. Um, the, the other thing that's really important on a campus is the rationale for the change. And, and if you can't provide a rationale, it's really difficult for anyone sitting on a university camp. Well, then why would we do it? Okay. And that's where one of the things having these relationships in the UIA and being able to call the other universities, what did you find? What did you learn? And the ability to bring those lessons back is is invaluable. 100%. Okay, so that I feel like you have given a lot of uh, wisdom for our audience, which is very generous. Um, I want to tee up uh, another opportunity, though. So you have a wild and crazy job. Okay, you were the person who was responsible for doing a lot of the frontline work that would lead to Purdue Global, correct? Yeah. yeah. So that's a weird thing to be. That's a curveball. <laughs> yeah, it's change management. Yeah. 
So you, you, you got introduced this big, scary, exciting idea. You're handling that. You're handling the UIA. You're handling all kinds of other things. I'm sure you work with the CIC or the Big Ten Academic Alliance, yeah, yeah. all kinds of stuff. How do you serve, what kind of tips and tricks have you picked up that allow Frank Dooley to show up and be able to deliver on all these things that frankly at times are competitive? Good question. Here, here's my tip of the day. And I think the bane of all of us is email. Um, here's what I try and do with email that I found to be useful. We have meetings and that, you know, our lives sometimes become meetings. And, and, and one of the ways to handle the meetings, if you would, I, I don't know, you know, here's an Outlook feature and the meetings are either going to be 30 minutes or an hour for some reason, right? Why is that the right number, et cetera? And, and, and when I walked into the role, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that reported to me and there's also the legacy, right? Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to have a meeting with you every two weeks. Well, why? Right? And, and, and what I've learned in the last couple of years that when it, my life got ex extra uh, crazy, if you would, I asked the first question, well, why am I meeting with you, all right? And some of the meetings were able to go away. What we did is some of the meetings, I've changed them rather than being a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I need some one-on-one -on -one meetings with everybody who is a direct report of mine just to make sure that, that once again, you have, we have to have this trust relationship between the two of us. But other times what I really need to do is I need to have a meeting around, let's say, orientation programs. Who are all the right people? Because I might have been having a meeting with, I'll say, John in the morning and talk about it. In the afternoon, I'll have a meeting with Sandy. And then the next day with Dan. And I talked about the same thing three times. And then I go, well, that was not very smart on my part. So I brought the three of them. I almost made it like a cabinet level approach to it. And then the, the subset, go back to this hour. I don't know why it's an always an hour. But, but one of the things that I've done that has been very popular, a lot of times when people come to see me, they want something, which, <laughs> which is okay, because if they don't need it, me, then why, why am I even here, right? But oftentimes what it is, they want me to send an email on their behalf somewhere else, to push a message, to et cetera, make an introduction, those kinds of things. Well, here's the problem that when I use the full hour for the meeting, because at the end, I'm right, I got to do this. And that my to-do list was getting longer. What I now do, I say, um, well, let's send the emails while you're still in the room. It's done a couple things. They come to the meeting knowing if I need something from Frank, I need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. So it means that they've thought it through a little bit. Because if it doesn't make sense to me, I won't do it. But now all of a sudden... They're really happy because what they want is done within the hour. They're not waiting for me because I'm probably going from one meeting to another. All right. And I'm happy because I didn't add to my to-do list. Awesome. This is good. I like it. Um, and I am mindful that I only have a certain amount of time with you. So I am going to wrap um, because it's uh, very generous of you to give our audience such insights. And uh, thank you so much, Frank, and for being a fantastic liaison. We really appreciate it and for you sharing some of the learnings from Purdue today.